Yesterday at about 6 p.m., I was working, and my father called me, and I wasn't able to take the call. And after I got off work, I listened to the voicemail, and I listened to him tell me that he has been diagnosed with cancer, and I... Um, and he said that he is not um, sure about his prognosis. He's, he's, he doesn't feel like he has a good chance. He's been having health problems all year. And um, he just found out why he's been having those health problems. And he's, he, um, he's, he's concerned about uh, his prognosis. He has um, uh, intestinal cancer, he just found out. What do you say to your father or your mother when they tell you that they have cancer and that they're going to die? What do you say? I couldn't call him back immediately. I had to I had to research it and see what this is really. Intestinal carcinoid and I had to think of what to feel, not just what to say before I could call him back. And I did call him back. And when I called him back, what I said was this. In cancer, the most fertile of sky signs, I shall build a house that will stand forever. And these are Audrey Lord's words. Audrey Lord had cancer and she died of cancer. In that poem, she was using a metaphor, as poets often do. She was talking about astrology in a way. She was saying that Cancer, which is June, Cancer is a time of vibrancy. Cancer is the astrological uh, time of water and, and of life. Autumn is barren, but June, Cancer, is a time of life. So let me just read that again. In Cancer, the most fertile of sky signs, I shall build a house that will stand forever. Audre Lord is saying that although her body is being eaten alive by something that's very much alive, cancer is very, very much alive in the body, just like viruses and bacteria, although her body is being eaten alive by it, the process of that was making her able to develop a body of work that immortalizes herself, and she's going to live on through her work. Okay. Audrey Lord had breast cancer, and somebody who, who, um, who we know a little more recently who had pancreatic cancer is Steve Jobs. And Steve Jobs was diagnosed with cancer in 2003. A lot of people don't know that. Apple has really only started to succeed in a huge way as a company since 2006 and 7. They came out with the MacBook Pro, and they came out with the iPhone a little bit later. And that company has almost surpassed Microsoft and in some ways even has. Now Steve Jobs got cancer in 2003. He did. The biggest impact of his life's work happened since he got cancer. Isn't that not phenomenal? That's phenomenal. He had, it, and, and he's had, uh, uh, it, was, it was terrible what he was going through, and he didn't want the public to know that. Since 2003, he had cancer, and look what he did in that time. I want to talk to you a little bit about Audrey Lord and her type of cancer. It's called breast cancer, which you've heard a lot about. There are some statistics out there. There's one that says 12% of women will get breast cancer. That's not set in stone, and it's sometimes contested, okay? But there, a lot of women get breast cancer, 6% is the minimum. It's between 6 and 12%, so that's a very, very good chance. It's, it's terrifying, the numbers of breast cancer. And there's also ovarian cancer, 2% of women get ovarian cancer. What is special about these two cancers? One of the reasons why Audrey Lord is very interested in them, they just affect women. Okay, that's the quality right there. So they just affect women. And you might say, well, yeah, but there's prostate cancer that affects only men. Actually, a lot of people don't know this. Prostate cancer doesn't kill men very often. Actually, it's usually quite harmless. A lot of men get it, over 80%, and it very, very rarely kills anyone. Men die of heart disease, they die of lung problems, but they don't really die of prostate cancer that much. So women are being impacted by cancer, 
breast cancer is the number one cancer killer in women. And interestingly, African Americans die of breast cancer more than white women. Um, so, so 20 percent. Um, they have a they have, black women have a 20 percent higher death rate from breast cancer than Hispanics and Asians, and a 10 percent higher death rate than white women. And income is also a factor. Black women, 35% uh, of they have a 35% morbidity rate for breast cancer. I'm sorry, lower. Um, I meant to say low income women have a 35% mor morbidity or mort mortality rate from breast cancer, and it's much, much, much lower for higher income women. So this is this is a big, a big, 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 big scary illness, and when you get breast cancer. Just with my father, um, what they do typically with cancer is resection, which means remove the cancerous area. Cancerous area. Um, in the case of breast cancer, that means removing a certain percentage of the breast tissue. A mastectomy, which you've heard about, which you've all heard about, is removing all of the breast. And that has a, we're going to talk more about that in a minute in the context of Audrey Lord. But just think about that in your head, what that means for a woman. And before 1998, now Avi Lord died in 1992, as you see on your sheet. Before 1998, women could try to have a breast reconstruction surgery, but it wasn't very often covered by insurance. Obviously, health insurance is a huge issue in this country. It determines a lot of things. I recently told somebody that in this country, there's nothing more powerful than a health insurance company. And so whether or not, before 1998, whether or not they could get that surgery uh, was a big issue, and it affected lower income. Notice how I'm bringing up this lower income thing. It affected lower income women disproportionately. Okay? 1998, they passed the Women's Health and Cancer Rights Act, which says simply, if a health insurance company covers the mastectomy, they have to cover the breast reconstruction surgery. It's a good bill they passed. Uh, but think again, once again, um, who in our country doesn't have health insurance? A lot of the poorest people in our country don't have health insurance. Obama tried to pass a bill that says everybody has to have it, but still a lot of people don't have health insurance, and I meet a lot of college students who don't have health insurance. So this is once again a disproportionate effect on lower income people, lower income women, who have that, that surgery for a life-threatening illness and then are not able to reconstruct the breast. Lord was diagnosed in 1976 or so with breast cancer. And I say or so because it's so difficult to get great facts on Audre Lorde and her life. She did not write a biography. She wrote a biomythography, which you see on that sheet there, which is, who knows, fact, fiction, somewhere in between. Actually, it's a whole new genre. And you see that on the, on the um, this, what I call this is a listing of life events. Um, and you see her age there, the progresses, and you see how young she died. And she was diagnosed in 1976 or 1977. I can't figure it out. I've been trying to. I can't quite figure it out. Um, but first it was benign, and then they, uh, it, it, later on it progressed, and we'll talk more about that in just a minute. But I want to start talking about Lord and who she was and her work. First thing you should know about Audrey Lord, is she would want me to say this, is that she was a black uh, feminist, lesbian, mother of two, warrior, poet. And she would want me to say that. She believed in labels, she believed that they are important, and she used them often. And, and um, a lot of people get turned off by her work because they feel that she is uh, polarizing. She feel, they feel that she is turning people off. And I admit, when I first read Sister Outsider, which you just saw my website published on, I was turned off, and I got over that. Um, I think people should be able to call themselves whatever they want to call themselves, and that should not turn us off. And that's something that's hard to get past with Audre Lorde. In 1980, she published Cancer Journals. Okay? I know you all have looked over the, the timeline of life events. Typically, I'd go over that first, and I will, I will jump into that, but I want to talk to you about all this. In 1980, she published um, a book called The Cancer Journals. And she did two works of prose on cancer. 
and she did some poetry too. But the majority of her life's work was before she got cancer. Okay, she did a lot of poetry, and two of those books you see, you're looking at two of her, her first books of poetry, and then you're looking at um, you're looking at uh, one of her books on cancer. And she did a lot of poetry before she got cancer, and it was very militaristic. It was it was very radical, and she, Audre Lorde is talking about race. She's talking about sexism. She's she's a, talking about feminism. And I'll just I'll just tell you a couple of her big things. Um, one of her big things was that feminists are not doing a great job because they're not considering race and economic class. And they saw feminism as a she saw feminism as a white woman thing, and that was a big issue for her. Now she also talked about. Um, the African American struggle and being black in America and what that means, and it meant a lot, a lot different, a lot of different things in her time as opposed to our time. And also, cancer was very different in her time as it is in our time. And as I told you, she died in 1992, but the heart of her work and the heart of her life was quite a bit earlier than that. And she published. She was a poet first and foremost, and she got into prose later on in her life and put some excellent works of prose out. She also spoke and attended conferences. And in 1980, she published her first work on cancer, Cancer Journals. Okay. I would encourage every single one of you to read this. It's, it's her, her, sadly, her work on cancer has lasted the longest and been republished the most because people value it so much. It's phenomenal. It's phenomenal work. All of her work is inspiring. This takes it to a whole new level with the way it impacts you. Because she was dying when she wrote it, and she was not the least bit diminished by the fact that she was dying when she wrote it. She was still a black feminist, mother of two, who cared for the world and was ready to change everything to make things better. She, so in, in the Cancer Journal, some of the issues that she discussed um, let me just give you a story. She went into a doctor's office post-op after the mastectomy. And uh, I think it was a nurse who told her, you're not wearing um, the prosthesis. Prosthesis is it's not, it's not cosmetic surgery. It's uh, something you wear that makes it look like you have a breast that's been removed. And this, this uh, nurse said, you're not wearing the prosthesis. Um, that kind of affects morale at the, the doctor's office here. Could you please wear the prosthesis? What did that mean to Audre Lorde? Well, Audre Lorde didn't think that the breasts of a woman are the most important part of a woman, and I hope you don't either. Um, she felt that, turn to the second page of this real quick, um, what you see there is an Amazon woman, and Audre Lorde, she, she felt that women, and notice, I want to tell you about this real quick, Audre Lorde felt that, that women are not defined by their looks, as none of us should, this here is a woman who has one, one breast. The Amazons were a tribe of women who were supposedly, um, they were born from a uh, god of war, Ares, and they would cut off one breast so they could shoot their bow and arrow better. And Audre Lorde loved to refer to them in her work. Uh, and she associated with mythological figures, especially African mythological figures. And it's said that the Amazons might have lived in Libya in Africa. So, just to be told, please wear your prosthesis because you're affecting our morale. <laughs> that that's like that's like a, a gasoline to Audre Lorde's fire right there. And she put that in her book, and a lot of reflections about um, cancer and how it, it affects a woman's vision of herself, her self-image. Okay, and she didn't believe that women should necessarily. She said she welcomed women if they want to wear the prosthesis, they may. Um, she didn't see any problem with that. If they want to do surgery, they may. But she encouraged women to see themselves as independent, strong units who are a little beyond whether or not people like their breasts. Okay? Um, she told women to envision themselves as warriors. There's been a lot of reaction to this book and her other. Some people say that her insistence on alternative medicines for treatment of cancer were counterproductive and even carcinogenic. Um, some people don't like her insistence on the, the independence of treatment, or independence 
against treatment and, and not necessarily relying on these, these um, crutches like prosthesis and things that try to improve the look of a woman after cancer. She thought women should, should wear that scar as something to show the world breast cancer and how it's affecting women disproportionately. Okay? It's been a phenomenal. Hearing stuff like that inspires me. That's phenomenal. That's, that's her resiliency and her braveness are admired by everybody who reads her works, whether or not they, they agree with the little things like that. Um, and, and this is uh, something that's very important to me. In that book, she questioned her mortality. And when she did that, when she asked herself about death, when she had to deal with her own death, she had a regret. And the main regret that she had was silence, times when she was silent. Okay. Audre Lorde didn't believe in silence, and she said in this book, My silences had not protected me. Your silence will not protect you. Okay. In 1988, she published A Burst of Life. That's her second book on cancer. A lot changed in between the, the publications of those two books. When the first one was published, she, was, she had had the mastectomy. She was fighting off cancer and... You never know what's going to happen with things. But when she published A Burst of Light in 1988, the cancer by that point had reemerged and it had moved to her liver. Okay? That's what happens with cancer. It starts in one loca location and then it um, gets called uh, metastasizes. It metastasizes to other locations of the body. The ones that happen here in the final stages of cancer. And it had moved to her liver. And so now she really was writing a book knowing that she was going to pass away. And I think that changed her writings a lot. But interestingly, uh, that didn't at all change her focuses. She still covered all bases. In A Burst of Light, she's talking about race. She's talking about sexism, feminism. She does talk about cancer. Um, it's a collection of different things. So there's a, there's a, a talk she gave in there, essays. So she didn't shy away. She didn't say, I'm just going to write about, I've got cancer. I'm just going to write about cancer now. She covered everything that was important to her. She was unfazed. You know, she, she felt a lot of pain. She put that into her work. But the spirit of Audre Lorde was unfazed by cancer. And one of the things she talked about in there was that she refused her biopsy and, and the alternative treatment options that she tried. And I already talked to you about that and how some people find that controversial. So there's, a, there's a real culture for women who follow breast cancer. And... A lot of that is very new, because in her time there was not a lot of um, a lot of gathering and support in circles of women who are affected by breast cancer. That's something new, and I think it's something she might have helped with. And she, so she criticized that as well, and she wanted women to come together and deal with this issue. And by the way, the pink ribbon thing that didn't happen until 1996, I think. She died in '92. So a lot of this culture of breast cancer is new. Okay. She wrote about pornography in that book. She wrote about male dominance. She wrote about the commercialization of sex. All things that she was, she was very much against. And interestingly, she had an essay in there called Apartheid, Apartheid uh, USA. And it was, this was 19, um, 1986 was when she wrote that essay. And this was published in 1988. So this is right in, in the height of Apartheid and got Nelson Mandela trying to do his job there. And she remarked that, that the situation for blacks in America was worse than South Africa. She felt that, that blacks were marginalized. Um, she felt that blacks were expendable and superfluous in America. So uh, once again, that rubbed a lot of people wrong. Great, great it did. And I'd encourage, if you want to learn more about, about her thinking on those issues, I'd encourage you to read her work. Really encourage you all to read her, her work. So, she died in, in 1992, and she was working on a book of poetry uh, when she died. That book of poetry is The Marvelous, written takes a distance, and it was published shortly after her death. We're going to read from it. It was published shortly after her death, and um, she had talked about that book and what she wanted, the effect that she wanted it to have when it, when it came out. So, we're, gonna, we're doing two poems here, and... Um, the first, are we almost out of time? Oh, that's terrible. Uh, I'm gonna, we're going to skip to the, so I separated the poems uh, with, with the Amazon. 
Now we're going to skip to the second poem. I really wanted to get you guys engaged, just like those Teach for America teachers. Uh, but we're instead, we're just going to skip to the, the second poem, and I'm going to read it to you. And I, I try to just say a, thi a thing or two about it, and then I have one more quote I want to read to you. Okay? And I just realized I don't actually have that poem uh, in front of me. Do you mind if I? I'll take. Do you, do you mind if I take yours? There's an extra. Is there an extra? Okay. okay. All right. And this is a poem she dated. She dated it uh, April 22, 1992. Um, I ran out of room on here, so this poem is called "Today Is Not the Day." dated April 22nd, 1992. I uh, committed a fallacy by omitting some lines in the middle. Um, I bet Professor McKay doesn't like that, but we'll just go ahead and read it here. Okay? I can't just sit here staring death in her face, blinking and asking for a new name by which to greet her. I am not afraid to say, I'm embellished, I am dying. But I do not want to do it looking the other way. Today is not the day. Could be, but it is not. Today is today. In the early morning, and in the early moving morning, sun shining down upon the farmhouse in my belly, lighting the well-swept alleys of the town growing in my liver, intricate vessels swelling with the gift of the model of her or her mischievous daughter. Fekete, fekete, my beloved. Feel the sun of my day surrounding, binding our pathways. We have water to care. I need a harvest, bright seed to plant. For the next fair. We will linger, exchanging sweet oil along each other's ashy legs, the evening light pressed on your cheekbones. This could be the day. I could slip anchor and wander to the end of the jetty, coil into the waters, the vessel of light and moonlight, ride the freshness to sundown. And when I am gone, another stranger will find you, coiled on the warm sand, beach treasure, and love you. And the different stories your seas tell, and half finished blossoms growing out of my season trail behind with a comforting hug. But today is not the day. Today. I'm going to leave you with a quote. That's a powerful poem for me. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to read you a quote and just say one thing about that poem. Okay, this is another quote from, from Audre Lorde. Pros. I want to live the rest of my life, however long or short, with as much sweetness as I can decently manage, loving all the people I love, and doing as much as I can of the work I still have to do. I'm going to write fire until it comes out of my ears, my eyes, my nose holes everywhere, until it's every breath I breathe. I'm going to go out like a fucking meteor. Okay? And... There's just one thing, this is, this is really why I came today to talk to you guys, it's just about this poem. It's, today is not the day. Today is not the day. Today, you all could shut up. You could. Today, you could hide who you are and what you feel. Today could be that day. Okay? Today, you could lie to yourself. Today, you could not follow your goals. Today, you give up. But today is not that day. Okay? Today is not that day. 